I'd like to invite you to, to give ear to the reading of God's Word. We're in Mark chapter 9 today, verses 1 through 13. Jesus went on to say, I tell you the truth, some standing here right now will not die before they see the kingdom of God arrive in great power. Actually, it turns out they didn't have to wait long at all. Um, here we go. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed, and his clothes became dazzling white, far whiter than any earthly bleach could ever make them. Then Elijah and Moses appeared and began talking with Jesus. Peter exclaimed, exclaimed Rabbi, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He said this, get this, <laughs> he said this because he didn't really know what else to say, for they were all terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus with them. As they went back down the mountain, he told them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept it to themselves, but they often asked each other what he meant by rising from the dead. Then they asked him, why do the teachers of religious law insist that Elijah must return before the Messiah comes? Jesus responded, Elijah is indeed coming first to get everything ready. Yet why do the scriptures say that the Son of Man must suffer greatly and be treated with utter contempt. But I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they chose to abuse him just as the Scriptures predicted. And, uh, and I'd love it if you would please join me in prayer. God, we do thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your intention, God, to reveal yourself to us, to show us Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, for the intention of your word to transform us, and so that's what we're praying for, Lord, for revelation, for transformation, Lord, that you would speak uh, above, beyond my words, God, we pray directly to each of our hearts and minds that we could hear from you as we need to, Lord, and that we would, Lord, be given along with that gift of revelation, the gift of faith, so that we could actually do what you tell us to do. For we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, so, in our journey through the Bible, we're making our way through the Gospel of Mark, and uh, while we're doing that, we're in this, this series in Mark called High King of Heaven, which is all about who Jesus is. And as we look in, in the Gospel of Mark, what we see is that actually uh, the, the, the author, John Mark, as he is inspired by the Holy Spirit to share the gospel, uh, the really based, we have historical witness based on the eyewitness testimony of Peter as he shares that with Mark. But um, we, we're talking about, you know, when God inspires Mark to write this, why is it actually that he inspires Mark to focus in on the identity of Jesus? That's what we keep coming back to again and again in the Gospel of Mark. Look at who Jesus is. Look at who Jesus is. Why is, why is that? And, and we said, as we were getting into this, we said that, that really uh, he's writing this, he's prompted to write this during a time of intense persecution of the church by the Roman Empire. So this is a time when people are, are really afraid, when they're experiencing pain and loss, and, and they're, they're not quite sure what's going to happen, and it is into that kind of time that God speaks this gospel word through Mark, specifically about who Jesus is. And here's what I believe. I believe that one of the reasons, one of the main reasons that God speaks through Mark to focus in on who Jesus is is because God knows that if folks will focus in, they will put their eyes, set their eyes on Jesus, and they come to know, really know his glory, his goodness, his love, truly experience his presence, that actually, actually, it is in Jesus that we will find the liberation from our fears, that we are freed from our fears. And it's really perfect. You know, it goes without saying, but God's really brilliant. Um, <laughs> Uh, we don't really need to say that, but uh, this is just amazing. It's amazing that God would use Mark to deliver this message. Look at who Jesus is, and he will free you from your fears, because that actually needed to happen for Mark. There's a story toward the end of the Gospel of Mark 
Uh, interestingly enough, it's not told in any of the other Gospels. doesn't appear in Matthew, not in Luke, not in John. This story is about a man who at the rest of Jesus was so afraid that he ran right out of his clothes and away from Jesus, right? Now, why is it only in Mark? Well, the thought is, and I think this is right, that actually this was Mark himself. He's sharing this story about himself. The other gospel writers didn't know this or they didn't think it was important enough, but it was important to him, wasn't it? This is what we read in Mark 14, 15. Then all his disciples deserted him and ran away. One young man following behind was clothed only in a long linen shirt. When the mob tried to grab him, he slipped out of his shirt and ran away naked. And I think Mark's saying, you know what, that was me. That was me running away controlled by fear. And actually, that wouldn't be the last time that this happens for John Mark. In fact, uh, it happens in a big way on the first missionary journey of Paul. You see, Barnabas and Paul had teamed up, and they were going to go on, on the first missionary journey to spread the gospel, right? And Barnabas says, hey, uh, I've got this nephew, really great guy, you know, he's got a lot of potential. Um, how about if we bring him along? Paul says, okay, fine, let's do that. So John Mark goes with Barnabas and Paul. Well, the first sign of trouble, the first time it starts to get tense, John Mark runs away literally runs home to his mom in Jerusalem, right? He leaves them, he abandons them, quickly heads back to Jerusalem. And I believe that Mark would say, John Mark would say, you know what, I know what it is to be controlled by fear. I know what that's like. And I also know what it's like to be liberated by the Lord Jesus Christ from your fear so that you can truly live for him. And, and listen, I, I, just, I just know and I, and I have to believe <laughs> that when the Lord says in his word that when the Son sets you free, you are free indeed, that that includes in that list of things the Lord's going to free us from is that he will free us from fear. And I have to believe that when the Lord's word says again and again, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. Why? Because I'm with you. Don't be afraid because I'm with you. I have to believe that that means that actually, actually the Lord does not want us to live in bondage to our fears that that's not what he wants for our lives, that in fact he wants us to be free. And so what we're doing this morning is we're looking into this amazing event called the transfiguration, the transfiguration of Jesus. And I, and I love the way R.C. Sproul, he, he puts this, he says, Jesus underwent a transformation, a metamorphosis. In fact, that's the Greek word that's used here in the scriptures, a metamorphosis, and suddenly the glory that was hidden and veiled in the cloak of his humanity burst forth, revealing the full deity of Christ to the watching disciples. So what we're going to look at first, our first point here, what we're going to look at is the glory of Christ. The glory of Christ. And, and here's the thing that's so amazing to me about this story is that, that at the transfiguration, what we see is the full revelation of the glory of God. It is, it is the full revelation of the glory of God. And why is that important? Because the human heart longs to see the glory of God, longs for the glorious presence of God. Whether we acknowledge it or not, know it or not, our souls, our hearts are hungry and thirsty after the living God, after his glory. We, we just, in Psalm 84, right, this morning, George led us through. How lovely is your dwelling place, O God. I long, yes, I faint with longing to enter the courts of the Lord. Now, that, that longing gets expressed in this really interesting way in, in Moses, way back in the Old Testament. So if we look into Exodus 33, Moses and God are having this conversation, right? This conversation about the Holy Land and, and everything that God has in mind for them. And, and Moses is, is, this is my paraphrase, of course. Uh, Moses is like, um, God, that's great, but um, you are going with us, right? <laughs> like, uh, God, I don't, I don't actually think we should do this if you're not going with us. And God's going to reassure him. He says, I will indeed do what you have asked. For I look favorably on you, and I know you by name. He says, Moses, you don't have to be afraid. I am with you. I know you. I've claimed you. You are mine. You don't have to be afraid. And after that, though, Moses responds this way from this deep longing of the human heart. He says, he says then show me your glorious presence. 
Lord, would you show me your glory? Essentially, I think Moses is saying, God, I hear your promises and I'm so grateful for your promises, but God, um, even though I believe your promises, would you help me believe your promises? Would you, would you help me overcome my unbelief? Would you give me confidence and courage as you reveal your glory to me? Right? He's expressing this longing of the human heart and, and God is so gracious to him that he's gonna do it. He's gonna do it. But here's the thing, it's only gonna be a partial revelation because here's the thing about human beings and, and, and God's glory and us and all that is that in our sin, we have actually caused a separation between us and God. And the scriptures tell us actually that we can't stand in the presence of God. We cannot even look upon the pure holiness of God. God says in the scriptures, no one may see me and live. And so what he does is he takes Moses and he puts him in the cleft of this rock and he's going to actually cover him. He's going to cover him as he passes by. And just as the Lord passes by, he's going to uncover his eyes so that he can just see the trailing edge of the glory of God. And as it turns out, God is so glorious that even just the trailing edge of his glory is enough to get you by, right? But what's really interesting here is that at the transfiguration, this is not just a partial revelation of the glory of God. It is the full, the fullness of God. It is the full revelation of the glory of God. And isn't it interesting and isn't it wonderful that Moses is actually there to see it, right? What he had asked for and received only partially, now he will receive fully in Jesus. Isn't that amazing? I don't know how God got him there, right? But God did. He was there and he got to experience the fulfillment of this, this longing of the human soul for the glory of God. Because you see, Jesus is not like God. Jesus is not partially God. He is, as, as the ensemble sang for us this morning, He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the second person of the Trinity of God Almighty. He is God. And so He is showing the glory of God. And, and so that's true for Moses. He can see the fullness of the glory of God mediated through Jesus Christ. And that is true for us as well. Because what Moses needed was he needed to see the glorious presence of God in order to live into the life that he had for him, in, in order to live in his calling in the Lord. And that's what the disciples need too, and that's a big part of what this is about, this transfiguration. The disciples are gonna see Jesus arrested, and they're gonna see him tried and tortured. They're gonna see him killed, and after his resurrection, they're gonna have a call to ministry to share the gospel placed on them, and they too will be persecuted, and they will need the same confidence that comes, that comes only from seeing from experiencing the glory of God, the glorious presence of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Listen, listen to what Peter says about this experience. We actually have a record of Peter reflecting on this experience of the transfiguration. It's in 2 Peter chapter one. We saw, he says, his majestic splendor with our own eyes when he received honor and glory from God the Father. The voice from the majestic glory of God said to him, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. We ourselves heard that voice from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Because of that experience, he says, listen, this is important. Because of that experience, we have even greater confidence in the message proclaimed by the prophets. In other words, Peter says, all of the promises of God are true and we have such confidence in them because we have seen the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. All of the promises where the prophets write about the coming of the Messiah who is God himself who will come to save his people from their sins, who will come to restore the world from the brokenness of sin. We have seen his glory and we have such confidence now in the promises of God. And so it was with Moses, so it was with the disciples and so can it be with us so can it be with us they needed to experience the glory of God to overcome their fear and so do we and so the next question then the next question is how right because we didn't get to be there on the mountain that day how is it that we experience the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ and the answer simply is this it is in worship 
It is in worship. And I'm not talking about the sort of dry, methodical, like just check it off. I, I have this duty. I've got to be here. I hope he's done by lunch because I'm really hungry. Let's get it done. Let's get it over with and get out of here. That's not what I'm talking about. I am talking about a gathering that has the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about a gathering of believers who are so in love with Jesus that in fact they love Jesus more than they love their own lives. I'm talking about a gathering of believers who have given themselves entirely to the Lord, who say to the Lord, Lord, I am yours, command me. I place my life in your hands. I'm talking about a group of believers who show up not to evaluate the preacher, not to evaluate the choir, but to declare the goodness of God because they simply cannot keep it inside. That's the kind of worship that I'm talking about. And that's the kind of worship that becomes this sort of thin place this thin place, you know, there's this veil that sort of separates heaven and earth, and that veil becomes very thin in worship, very thin. And the Lord actually, even as we're declaring His goodness, He is showing us His goodness. He is actually making His glory, His glorious presence, His manifest presence to shine on us. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. And so we overcome fear by seeing the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But second thing now, we overcome fear by seeing and setting our eyes on the glory of heaven, the glory of heaven. Now, um, I don't know about you. I, I hope this is true for at least a couple of people in the room. Um, but, but I actually have to deal with fear in my life. It's, okay, two, there are two of us. That's good. Um, yeah, and you know, one of the things that I do and I, I hope this isn't weird, but I've already told two services, so I may as well tell you two, right? Uh, I hope this isn't weird. But one of the things I do is like worst case scenario. Like, okay, here's something I'm afraid of. Let me think of like the very worst thing that could happen. Let me just, let me just think on that. And what I find is <laughs> that as we set our eyes on heaven, the worst case scenario is this. I have a really hard life in this life. I, I struggle and I have pain and I have loss, but I walk out that entire journey with the Lord Jesus Christ holding my hand. And I know his love every day and I see his miracles in my life. And I know, and I know that he won't let go of my hand, but that he will actually take me all the way home. So the worst thing that could happen to me is that I live day in, day out, really struggling in this life, but all the while walking out with him, all the while knowing that the struggle of this life, the trouble that I have in this life can't even begin to be compared to the glory of what is to come, that that is actually worst case scenario. And I'm just thinking in the face of such glory, how in the world could any fear survive? I mean, really, how could any fear truly survive? survive. You know, what we're seeing here is the light of heaven because the scriptures tell us that, that in the kingdom of heaven, there is no sun, there is no moon. At, and, and the reason is they're not needed, right? Because the Lord is the light. And so what they're seeing here is the light of heaven. They're bathed in the light of heaven. They are. And what we see is that actually heaven is more real than anything we've actually seen in this world. Right? We think of it the opposite, that, that heaven is like this fantasy place and there are clouds and there are people that are playing, uh, I don't know how you play a harp, but you know, however you do that, and, and they're floating around and they have little wings, you know, and that's, we, listen, heaven is not fantasy land. It is more real than anything we've seen in this world because it is eternal. And they are bathed now in the light of heaven. And so Peter, who is the apostle after my own heart, right? He does not know what to say, so he believes that the best strategy is to say something. <laughs> it's incredible, right? But listen to what he says. Rabbi, it's wonderful for us to be here. And he says, listen, I've got this idea, Jesus. Let me just run this by you. Um, let's just say I build you a tent. I build Elijah a tent. I build Moses a tent. It's going to be great. We can just live here. It is wonderful to be here, right? Because they they are knowing, they are feeling, they are experiencing the light of heaven radiating upon them. They've been given this vision of the glorified Christ. 
And I can't help but think, I can't help but think about Paul and his kind of debate that he has in Philippians. It's a debate with himself and it's, it's really not about him like, I, I want to give up on life. It's not about that. It's really about comforting the church so that they know that when his time comes to give his life for Christ, that he's okay. In fact, that he's happy. He's having this debate and he, he says, I don't know what I, what I want more. You know, do, I want to depart and be with Christ. Do I want to be with you? Do I want to stay here? And he says, finally, I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. And I think about Stephen and what God did for him. Stephen stood firm for the Lord Jesus, and he becomes the first Christian martyr. And, and even while he is being killed, like literally, they are in the act of killing him, he is not afraid. Why? Because the Lord has given him a vision of the glory of heaven. Listen to what happens. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God. And he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. And he told them, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Stephen isn't afraid because he sees the glory of heaven. And I think about Jesus' promise that he would never leave us alone, that in fact when the time comes, that he will come to get us so that we can be where he is. And I think about his promise, how we don't have to be afraid, how our hearts don't have to be troubled because he has prepared a place for us. In fact, he says, listen guys, would I have actually told you I've prepared a place for you if I hadn't actually prepared a place? Of course I've prepared a place for you. So you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be troubled. Now, Last thing then, last thing. What about our response? What about our response to the, this revelation of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ? What is our response in the face of this revelation of the light of heaven? What is the appropriate response? And thankfully, we don't have to wonder, right? Because, because the Lord gives us his word. This is my dearly loved son, the father proclaims. And then three words, our response. Listen to him. That's our response. And, and specifically what I want to focus this in on is this, that, that God would call us, he would have us listen to Jesus rather than listen to our fears. Because I don't think, myself included, I don't think we really know how much day in and day out our fears control us. I don't think we even realize that. How our fears keep us from doing what God wants us to do keep us from being a blessing as he wants and that make us do things that we shouldn't I don't I don't think we actually realize fully how much fear controls our lives and the father declares this is my son this is who he is he is the son of the living God listen to him not to your fears trust in him not in your fears and why is it that we can trust in him we can trust in him because he is faithful because the glory of God is revealed in Jesus on that mountain that day. It truly, truly is. But you know, the glory of Christ is revealed nowhere more fully than on a hill called Calvary. That is where the glory of Jesus is revealed most clearly and powerfully. You know, the, the, the disciples, bless their hearts. <laughs> it's, a, it's kind of a southern thing, right? Bless their hearts. They are fixated. They are fixated on this question about Elijah. Well, Jesus, what about this Elijah? Shouldn't he have come? Isn't he supposed to come? Why do they say he has to come before the Messiah? And, and, and Jesus says, okay, just calm down. Listen, he has come. It was John the Baptist. He was ministering in the, in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Elijah's come. That's, that's true, but that's been done. Here's the more important question, Jesus says. Why did the scriptures say that the Son of Man must suffer greatly and be treated with utter contempt? That's the really important question. Why is that? Why is it that the scriptures say the Son of Man must suffer greatly and be treated with utter contempt? You know, there's another prophetic vision that ties in with the transfiguration. And that vision is found in Zechariah chapter three, the book of the prophet Zechariah. And he's given this vision, and in this vision, this high priest is standing before God, right? So high priest standing before God, this high priest's name is Joshua. Uh, Joshua, incidentally, is a Hebrew name. The Greek version of that name is, wait for it, Jesus. Coincidence? Uh, no, I don't think so. 
So this high priest named Joshua is standing before God. And here's the disconcerting part of this vision. The disconcerting part of this vision is that he is standing before God in filthy clothes. This is what it says, that his clothing was filthy. And what's going to happen here is this exchange of clothes, this exchange of clothes that is, it is symbolic of the forgiveness of sins. This is what we read. God says, see, I have taken away your sins, and now I am giving you these fine new clothes. And the point is that what we see here in this vision is our great high priest, Jesus Christ, standing before the throne of God in filthy clothes. Where did he get them from? He took them from us. He took our sins with him to the cross. So that, why? So that he could give us his robe that is so white. The scripture says there is no bleach on earth that could get it this white. He gives us that robe so that when we stand before God, we are completely clean, completely pure, completely free from our sins, washed white as snow. This is what Jesus has done for us. That is his faithfulness. And I, I just, just have to say that is somebody that we can trust, that we can trust way more than we can trust our fears. We can trust Jesus actually with everything, everything, because he gave everything for us. Amen? Amen. So if you would, I'd, I'd like to ask you to please pray with me. Oh God, we, we want to pray like Moses prayed, that Lord, you would show us your glory, that you would just overshadow us, Lord, with your manifest presence. Lord, that you would in that way liberate us from our fear so that, Lord, so that we can follow you and you alone. You have declared, Lord, this is my son, listen to him. And that is the prayer of our hearts, Lord. Would you liberate us by your glory so that we could follow him, trusting him more than we trust our fears. In Jesus' name, amen.